Hello, so many people. I'm amazed. Two years ago when I started, I used to ask in conferences when I was talking about OCP, how many people have heard of OCP in Europe? And I remember in one of the first ones I did, there were 200 people in the room and four people put their hand up. It's amazing. How many people live in Europe here? Can we just have a show of hands? Could we have the lights up to just have a grasp of this? Keep your hands up. I'm just trying. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's amazing. Two-thirds of you from, from the European region. It's amazing. I'm really, really pleased. Very pleased. Right, let's crack on and tell you a story. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, Moore's Law on open source steroids. The impact that open source can make to innovation. These um, little green arrows are going viral. Does anybody know the meaning of the OCP logo, for example, sitting in the audience? Why are there all these arrows in the logo? Anybody? Any hands? Nobody really knows, do they? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about what I think they're about, okay? but it's not the actual truth. You'll have to explore the truth later. So my job, what I really do, I see myself as some kind of Greek god, like Eros. And I fire these little green arrows, OK? And when they land in people, they become passionately involved with OCP. And I look in at the front here, I can see a couple of passionate guys there from Luxembourg and uh, all around me. It's, it's so wonderful. And once they've got the arrows in them, they, they are amazingly passionate on what they do. And at the end of the day, it's just the people that make the difference. It's just the people. And it's about building the community. Now, what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and do this as a Pomodoro. And a Pomodoro is a 25-minute intense session of intense concentration. And it's used by open source software engineers. OK? Now, it's called a Pomodoro because the guy who started promoting it used this uh, kitchen timer. It was like a tomato, which is Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. But what I've done, I'm jazzing it up a bit, and we've got a new Pomodoro. We've got this one. So we've got an open source Pomodoro. And what we're going to do, we're going to do 25 minutes of stuff that might be a bit radical. You'll need to concentrate. Now, in order to really kind of get into this, this new mindset, you really need to kind of read a broader horizon of books. And I'd strongly recommend you read these books. Uh, the F Zero Marginal Cost Society, and thank you for being late, is really showing you the way the future is going. And I had a very interesting discussion with uh, an engineer yesterday, and we was talking about the traditional hardware companies, how they just are not changing when the world around them is changing, and how predominant open source is becoming. Now, openness starts big. This is, we're into the 70th year of the first stored program control computer. It's called the Baby in Manchester University. And it was just open hackers, and they developed it, and then it just went on. It went over to America, it went around the world. This is the beginning of it, 70 years ago. You can go and see this computer up in Manchester. And I did a pilgrimage to it just a few months ago for its 70th anniversary. It also starts big when you start looking at all innovations. The beginning of, does anybody know why the parts of an aeroplane, an aeroplane, use French words, for example? And yet, the first flight of a heavier than air machine took place in America. Well, what's interesting is when the Wrights brothers did this first flight, and remember, in the beginning, it was an open source sharing community, they then decided they were going to patent a certain aspect of the control system on the aeroplane. Well, what happened then, all the innovation moved to Europe. And these two brothers spent seven years of their lives just chasing patent royalties 
and never really did anything more. But the innovation was happening in an open community in Europe. Now, I believe sharing and openness and collaboration, it's hardwired into our genetic. It's in our DNA. It's really there. It's part of us. And especially when you're preschool, before you go to school, school has an impact on the way you think. I'll explain. Now, there's been loads of studies done, sharing experiments, and this is a sharing experiment done with two children. And there's two pots. And under one of the pots, there's a goodie. And under the other one, there's nothing. And when the children lift the pots up, they always share. They always share the item. Always. Now, what we're going to do, towards the end of this, I'm going to get up some community members. And we're going to do an experiment just here with these boxes. And the community members are going to lift them up. There should be four of them down in this audience somewhere. They've got no idea what's going to happen. Um, and we're going to see what happens. And this is a thank you for the community through these four people who are going to come up on the stage. But it's basically we're going to run this sharing experiment and see what happens. Because what happens, there's the youngsters sharing, but then they send us to school. And when we get these difficult problems, they isolate us. They isolate us. I think that's fundamentally wrong. And I think what open source communities do, they change that in a fundamental way. Now, open science and open source science is about disclosure. If you look at this, Newton wrote about calculus in 16... 66. But in those days, there wasn't any scientific publications. He had to write a book in order to disclose it. Well, he didn't write that book until about 30 years later. Can you imagine if he had the internet at that point in time and he could just release it into the public domain, how much more rapid the use of calculus would have been? Now, that's what we have today. We have the internet. We can release stuff really fast into the public domain in a global context for everybody to use. Now, there's some very good academic studies started to come out now. Um, this here is a link to a YouTube video of a guy doing a presentation in America about this big study. If anybody wants access to this study showing you the science behind open source and rapid innovation, contact me afterwards. Now, OCP Gear Now, what it's doing from the book called Crossing the Chasm, that book I referenced at the beginning, what you see, this is the dispersion, the dispersion of disruptive technologies for a market. So you get the innovators at the beginning, the early adopters, and then you get this red region and in this red region, this is where the tornado happens. This is the, the early majority. This is what's happening now. This technology is now going into the enterprises. And when you get into this space, there's a lot of confusion. There's often high demand, but there's no supply channel. And this is where we are now. So the early innovators, the big hyperscalers, are using this stuff Millions of these servers. You just don't see them because you never go into a hyperscale data center, many of the people in the room. But there's millions of servers going out. Now, if you just track the adoption of Linux, the Linux Foundation started in 2000. Today, it's dominant. It's absolutely dominant. And what's interesting, open source hardware, is following a very similar trend. If you looked at the total production of servers, it's following a very similar trend as we move through time. Now, just to show you some of the ideas about building better mousetraps, 
Uh, is Roberto in this room? If he is, can he put his hand up? Right, Roberto. Now, Roberto is a chap I met about one year ago now in Denmark. And he did a presentation in a, in a conference in Denmark, and he said, we need to reduce the capex and opex on data centers by 50% to have a chance for survival of enterprise data centers and not being eaten alive by hyperscalers. And he said, the only way we can do it, and I didn't know the guy, the only way we can do it is to get together and work together and create a community and open things up. Well, he's now part of the OCP community, and in March this year, he started a project, a sub-project, on modular data centers, containerized data centers. And just in this short time, they've now developed a product, they've got designs for a product, it's 66% lower capex than a traditional containerized solution. And there's more room for innovation that could take that to a substantially lower price. It's, it's profound. And it happens because he communes with these talented people who self-elect themselves to come in and play with him in this community. And they're doing radical things. This is just one example. Now, it's happening elsewhere as well, if you just read this. There are no patents on Tesla cars. If you want to make one in your garage, you can do. But one thing you get from these, when you start opening things up, you get much better products very, very fast. Example here, the fastest growing manufacturer in America grew 700% each year for the last three years. It's an open source manufacturer. There's an initiative in Denmark for open source manufacturing across the industries of manufacturing in Denmark. The Nordics and the Scandinavians are way in front with the kind of the mental reset, how they see the future moving. This is a slide that I took from uh, the Open Source Summit recently. And basically, it says, uh, every market where Linux has entered, i.e. the open source communities enter, they eventually dominate that market. And there's a few numbers. And we're seeing it as well with the hardware side. And it's a kind of a game one story in a way. Microsoft purchased GitHub for $7 billion this year. And GitHub is the repository for all the Linux code. It's where we keep all the open source software. And they bought it for $7 billion. Microsoft contribute more lines of code into Linux than probably any other organization. They're a big, big, big consumer of OCP gear. They're Olympus solutions. That's a big change. You just go back a few years. It's, it's a profound change. Now, there are a few other things that OCP servers do. They, they're just better in so many respects than your traditional servers. Have a look at this. This is European legislation that's just been voted through. And Rabi is in this ordinance, because we're going to touch on this European legislation that a lot of people might not be aware of. We're going to have a session on it. I think it's tomorrow. Have a look at this up here. At idle power, an OCP server uses 50% less energy than a traditional server. Now, part of this legislation is to address the energy inefficiency at idle power in servers. And there was a kind of a bit of a media storm in the last month where some manufacturers didn't want this legislation to go through because it was really going to hurt their product. So the compromise is they're going to delay the legislation. It should have been coming in in January 2019. It's going to come in a year later, in 2020. But OCP don't need the legislation. The innovators in OCP have created solutions that are just so much better. Streets ahead. Now, if we have a look at uh, this comparison, after the 50th year of um, Moore's Law, some Intel engineers did a comparison 
and they took a 1971 Volkswagen and they applied the Moore's Law to the Volkswagens. What they came out with, that the Beetle would be doing 300,000 miles per hour. It would get 2 million miles to the gallon of gas or petrol, and it would cost 4 cents. And everybody keeps talking about Moore's Law as being, everybody should be chasing Moore's Laws. It's the ultimate level of innovation. Have a look at this. Oh, by the way, the, they withdrew the, uh, the Volkswagen last month. What this is, this is showing you the cost of mapping a human genome or a genome the size of a human genome. Now, in 2001, it was $100 million. Today, it's less than $1,000. Look at it in comparison to Moore's Law. Who would like to suggest why that happens? Why it's happening is because the genomics community got together in about 1997 in Bermuda, and they came up with a principle. And the principle was to release everything within 24 hours onto the internet, into the public domain. This is why Moore's Law looks like a slow walk in the park compared to what the genomics community are doing. If we had this kind of community applied to microchips, where would we have been after 50 years? Where would we be today? Take some thinking about it. Do the calculations on the beetle with that, and you'll see how fast it goes. Now, what this is, this is the largest machine ever made by humans. And it's open, and it's called the internet. And this is a computer-generated map of the internet. And it's, what it's done, it's generated these fractal pictures. But it's, I, I like the picture. Now, try and imagine this. What would happen in the world without open source today? This chap came up, Stephen Johnson. For starters, the internet and the web would instantly evaporate. Every Android smartphone, every iPad, every, I every Mac would go dark. A massive section of the energy infrastructure would cease to function. The global stock markets would go offline. Planes would drop out of the sky. It would be an event on the scale of a world war or pandemic. And that's where we are today with open source. It's so built into everything that we do today. It's so built in. So there, Endif, the Pomodoro, the open source Pomodoro. Now, what I would like to do, I'd like to thank the European community because there's so many passionate Europeans out there that are doing some really great stuff, but I, I can't get them all on the stage because we just don't have time. So I'm going to invite four people up onto this stage, and I'm going to run an experiment. But what I'm really going to do, if they could come up on the stage and come up this staircase. So we've got Robert. We've got Jean-Marie. Come up on the stage, just here. We've got Menno. Come up. I'll introduce you to the groups. Just come up here and stand behind those boxes. Roberto? Where is he? Come on. He didn't know about this at all because, um, and then we've got Mark Dancy. Where's Mark Dancy? Is he in the audience or is he, no? What we're going to do then, <laughs> come on. Come on, come on. I could choose loads of people to come up, but I'm really, it's a thank you to everybody. Everybody that's been involved. Yeah, these are just four people as a representation. And what we're going to do, we're going to give them something, but it's giving it to the community, to all these Europeans, OK, that have been involved. And we're going to do that experiment. We're going to do a sharing experiment. And what we're going to find out is how much 
they were indoctrinated when they went to school. Okay? And how much their basic genetic kind of genome for sharing and collaboration is still in play. Now, this is the experiment. They don't know. They, this is all new to them. It's a big surprise. Thank you for all coming up. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to lift these boxes. And you saw where the children lifted the boxes, and then they did something. They shared stuff, didn't they? Now, what we're going to do, we're going to get these guys to lift this, these boxes, to put the boxes behind them, not yet. And then what's going to happen is they're going to commune with each other, and they're going to decide how they're going to share what's there. OK? So this is the exercise. And you have to make the decision while you're on stage, and then walk off the stage, taking with you your solution for sharing. So take the boxes off. So this is the problem they've got. Now, between them, they're going to work out what they're going to do. Let's have a look. <laughs> Never done this experiment before. It could be a damp squib. So you're going to share them amongst yourselves, and then you're going to, once you've shared them, you're going to walk off with the items that you're going to take as part of the sharing exercise. So you've got to work out how you're going to share them. So what's the decision? What are you going to do? Right, now I thought they would do that. Now the decision, what they've done, they've come up with this. These guys, they're just innately, they're, they just share. So what they're going to do, they're going to split them. The two guys in the middle are going to take a pair each, and then they're going to share them later with the others. Now that is the ultimate sharing. And I didn't know they were going to do that, but I thought that they would. I was a bit worried that they would take one shoe each and walk off with it and stick it on the wall. But, uh, but no, and this is what these guys do. And it's really quite amazing. I think we should give them a big hand, and a big hand to the community as well. Well done. Thanks very much.